Hey everyone, it's Jacqueline and Adam at Texidas PhD. We have just recently returned from our adventure over to Disneyland Paris. We're not gonna do like a day by day breakdown of everything we did or anything, but I thought we could share some highlights and lowlights of our trip. If you're interested in hearing our take on the good and the bad of Disneyland Paris, stay tuned. Thanks so much for being here. We really appreciate it. If you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe. Then you can hit that bell icon to receive notifications whenever we upload new videos. And if you enjoy the content, like the video, share with a friend, all that helps the channel so much. And the best place to chat is probably in the comments down below on YouTube, but you can find me outside of YouTube on Twitter and Instagram. I am at PixieDustPhD. All right, let's get into Disneyland Paris. So I think we'll start with the bad and end on the good note. My first bad thing is really like, just in general, the second park, the Walt Disney Studios park, um, is lacking. It needs a lot more and they are, they're building out the frozen land. I think they're putting Star Wars Galaxy's Edge out there. So in a few years, I'm sure it'll be fine. But for now, there's just like not that much to do. So lines get really long. It feels quite congested. Even like the shows, like the Frozen sing-along show or whatever, like the, the next one kind of gets full pretty early. So I just felt yeah. like it needs more. Like there's so much construction going on and it's not super easy to navigate around. Mm. I mean, it's small, so that helps, yeah. right? But, um, you know, outside of uh, Avengers Campus, you know, I felt like that it was very, not a lot of stuff there. Yeah, it's, I mean, every time we went over there, we were like, well, do you want to do Tower of Care again? You want to do the Remy ride again? Like, <laughs> that was kind of that. So, yeah, I mean, they're addressing the problem in a few years. It should be hopefully phenomenal but if you're going in the meantime i would say like keep your expectations low for that park overall yeah no i definitely thought it was the lesser of two parks we did not we did, did the rides we wanted to do and then you know the shows would fill up like 10 minutes after the last one had gone in and it was just um there's definitely good stuff there but yeah. it was definitely um not our preferred park for sure no and if you're only going to go for a day trip I don't even think it's worth getting a park hopper. I would just get the single base ticket and just go to Disneyland Park. Like, unless you really, really want to see something in Walt Disney Studios Park, I don't think it's worth it. Yeah, again, rides, they're fun. Um, I mean, again, Avengers Campus, really cool. If you haven't been to um, LA and their Avengers Campus, right, um, and you want to check out, it's very similar. Um, pretty cool, but that was really the only, again, I know we're talking low lights, but that was probably the highlight for me um, in terms of the, the park. Yeah, their Avengers Campus at Disneyland Paris, I think is much better than Disneyland Resort, simply because they weren't squished into such a small space, like at Disneyland Resort in California, like that feels small. And I mm -hmm. think because it is, versus the Disneyland Paris one is, is much more like grand, it's more what you think of of a land. So, I mean, it is cool. And if you're gonna be there for more than one day, you know, get the park hoppers, I think it's worth it. But it's just like, that park in general just needs some help, I think. Yeah, like Jacqueline said, it's on the way. Yeah. A low light for me at the Disneyland Paris parks was probably the food. I know, surprising Paris, not good food, but um, you know, outside of you know a couple select booths or special items, I mean, there's no real signature food that you know we were really amped up to try and go. And that's definitely a highlight for us when we go to um, Disney World, uh, whether that's uh, you know food and wine festival or just snacks in general at the parks that we always try and enjoy. Um, you know, it was like, do you want a croissant and a coffee? Uh, great, that's it. And then the only like cool things that were there had lines that probably were longer than some of the rides. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the ride lines were not short, right? So, um, you know, again, I, I'd say that dining outside of the parks or, you know, even if like a table service was, was definitely the way to go if you wanted to actually get some good food. Yeah, this was also definitely on my list of low lights was food. One specifically was the lack of breakfast options. So that might be a cultural thing. Maybe breakfast is not a big deal in France. It kind of is a big deal in America. And I don't need like a full on breakfast, but it would be nice if there were some more quick service options. It pretty much just is like a couple places you can get a croissant in either park. Otherwise you need to be going to like Starbucks in their version of downtown Disney, or like Prita Manger, however you say that, whatever, like fast casual places outside the parks. And even in the hotel, there's no quick service options in the hotel. So like you can get full on breakfast in your hotel, but it is expensive and I definitely don't eat that much. So for the most part, lunch places didn't open till like 11 or 11.30. So it's not even like you can just grab a snack from somewhere very easily and like wait till lunch, you really 
had to figure out your breakfast plan in advance, which was not the best. And then, yeah, just in general, like food and drinks were not very inventive. A lot of the foods felt like really Americanized to me. Very much. So. Which was kind of weird, I think, because yeah, you're in France, like they have wonderful French food and all other of this other like nearby European countries that they could source from. But yeah, and, and like drinks too. So for the most part, you couldn't really find cocktails inside the parks, which I thought was strange. Compared to Disney World, it was a little strange. Next for me in low lights is generally speaking characters, but I'll start with the Princess Pavilion. <laughs> so Princess Pavilion is, you know, their fairy tale hall, whatever it's called in, in Walt Disney World, where you can meet like Rapunzel and Cinderella and Tiana. And then one other that I think lately has been from uh, Elena of Avalor, but they may, I don't know, they may have changed her out. But anyway, so it's, the, it's their version of that. Fine. It's very popular. I understand. But it's like three hour wait popular. And then you also don't know who you're meeting. They change it out every day. They won't tell you in advance. So you're waiting for two plus hours and you could be meeting someone you don't even care about. I think that's a total sham, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I mean, they try and play it up as part of the fun, but it is, it is not fun. I don't think it's fun. And the other thing is you wait for two hours and they definitely have two princesses meeting and you only get to meet one of them. So that also was like, I thought you would cycle through both rooms at least. Nope, no. one princess. It was very much like, uh, do you want English or French yeah. princess? And again, that that's basically how you pick which princess you get and then you're ushered out very quickly. Yeah, it was, I don't know. I'm not mad we did it, but I just think they could do it better. I think you could at least post like what the princesses are so people had a better idea of if they really wanted to wait for two hours or not. Mm -hmm. And then characters in general, a lot of them were never communicated. Like a lot of them were not in the app. Some of them did have permanent signs up near where they did meet. And, but it would be like two and a half hours. It's like 11 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. And I'm like, what? They only came out during lunch and they had posted signs, but they weren't in the app. It was very chaotic. Yeah. Um, and some of them yeah. didn't even have these posted signs. Right. So you would just like see Chippendale walking from backstage. I'm like, what the heck? Like there's no Chippendale. We never saw a Chippendale sign, not even where they were meeting. No. They're not in the app. There's just like no way for you to know how long are they meeting? When are they meeting, et cetera? Like what is going on? <laughs> Yeah, the number of times we randomly happened upon a character and we decided to just go do the meet and greet, um, you know, it was multiple times. Yeah, I mean, the spontaneity factor, like it's neat that they just have characters out and around sort of more like Disneyland in California. I don't mind that, but I think they could just communicate if they are doing a set meet and greet. And because it is for such a limited time during the yeah, day, like so a short time, you should be able to find that out somewhere. It's like if you have a long lunch, you're not meeting characters that day. Literally. And then even for characters that have a permanent indoor spot, so, you know, weather and stuff isn't a factor, their meet and greet times were very short. So like Meet Mickey was like 10 a.m. to 4 or 5 p.m. when we were there. Parks opened at 8.30. For example, they closed at 11 p.m. It's like, why is Mickey not meeting past 5 p.m.? Same with the Princess Pavilion. Starts at 10 a.m., closes between 4 and 5 p.m. depending on the day. Like. I don't understand. I don't like it. I don't appreciate it. Like when we were in Epcot one time, we skipped fireworks. So it was night, it was like nine or 10 PM. And we met Baymax and we met Joy and we met Minnie and Mickey and I think Donald, like, cause they had inside secured spots. There was no reason they couldn't just keep meeting. Yeah, Donald was very jealous that no one wanted to meet with him. That's true. But anyway, <laughs> so yeah, the, the whole character experience, I would say is very, very different <laughs> and not well communicated and it could be super limited hours. So if there's someone you really want to meet, I would just ask a cast member like right when you get there, what's up? Because otherwise, like, good luck. And they may not even know, honestly, it's that chaotic. Yeah. <laughs> All right, the last big low light on my list, and I think, I hope Adam will agree, is basically overall operations, especially with regard to crowd control. Oh, yeah. It was actually chaotic at times. It was so poorly planned. So let's, let's have an example. After fireworks, when everyone is doing their mass exodus out of the parks, they should know that. They surely know that. They never took down barriers for like splitting the walkways between people going into the parks and people leaving the parks. So like two thirds of the walkway was still set up for people to come into the parks when it's past park closed. So, and they're just like light little plastic fence things. Like you could easily lift them and push them aside. And as so everyone's going through that and then everyone's like walking through their version of downtown Disney. 
blah, blah, blah. Some people are peeling off to go to the train station, fine. People are peeling off to get Ubers, whatever. But then the path we had to walk through to get to our hotel um, was literally down to a single file line to leave. Like, again, little plastic fence things, like you could easily move those. It was so absurd to me. Yeah, it was pretty wild to see like, you know, they could just spend 10 minutes, a crew of 10 people can just move all these out of the way and it would reduce all the bottlenecks and just make it so much easier to move, right? Yep. Like three double wide strollers and that's a bottleneck, right? Yep. Um, and these are of course Disney wide avenue paths that should easily accommodate large crowds, but we're not doing so. I hope it was just a mistake. But it happened the whole time we were there. Yeah, long, long mistake. And same with crowd control, like during fireworks, fireworks were at 11 p.m. when we were there. Apparently people start claiming their spaces at 8 p.m., which whatever, more power to you. But instead of like actually try to control that, like put tape on the ground where like you have to keep these walkways clear or have cast members walking through with their little light up sticks that are like, you have to keep this walkway clear until at least like a half hour before the show starts, you know, they just like rope, roped it off. They just had cast members like rope off all these access points to the hub and be like, yeah, sorry, there's too much crowds. <laughs> like, yeah, they what? basically closed like a quarter of the park yeah. uh, two hours before fireworks. It was absurdly um, early. Yeah. And they did not have anyone like monitoring safety in those crowds because it was so dense and they had no way to get in there and maybe didn't care. I don't know. But yeah, the amount of kids we saw like up on top of like very thin fence railing and their parents just holding them. I'm like, this is this would never be allowed at Walt Disney World. Never. Yeah, they only cared if they fell off the railing onto the grass. Then they oh, yeah. started to like, you, you know, can't touch the grass. Yeah. But yeah, I guess like <laughs> it's fine to just like stand on the railing, I guess, which is obviously incredibly dangerous, I think is the main thing I'm concerned about, but also super rude because then you have all these like kids that are crazy tall all of a sudden. Yeah, no, I definitely agree 100 percent Jacqueline. That was that was not fun at all. Yeah. There are a bunch of other, I think, like operations misfires on there, and they could really learn a lot from the American park systems there. But just in general, like there is no aspect of crowd control. The rules, I think, are very lax in comparison. So be prepared for that. I found it really frustrating, generally speaking. Let's talk about what we enjoyed and really liked about Disneyland Paris. Um, so it was the 30th celebration. So there were a lot of special things going on. Um, I really enjoyed how they leaned into kind of a steampunk vibe um, throughout the parks. Um, now that's obviously um, a prime feature of like their tomorrow or future land area. I think it's called Discovery Land there. Discovery Land, yeah. But it, it kind of has a steampunk geary vibe and they kind of incorporated that into the 30th celebration. Um, so when you enter in the park, it's really cool like decoration celebrating the 30th. It's very geary, very cool. And it's also reflected a lot in the parade floats and the other floats as well. Um, you know, Mickey has like a steampunk costume. Um, so I thought that was really well done, just kind of that connecting thread of theming throughout the Disneyland park. Um, so I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I don't know if the parade is specifically for the 30th anniversary or not, but it definitely does connect, like the 30th anniversary theming connects into existing park elements very well. One of my big highlights is Champagne on Main Street, which I know is a little bit silly, but it is just so novel to me to be able to drink a glass of champagne and like look at the castle and take in the vibes because you definitely cannot do that in America. Yeah, open container, perfectly fine. Yeah. <laughs> so if the champagne card is out while you're there and you like champagne, I highly suggest it. It was $15, 15 euros when we were there, uh, which I think is a pretty good deal because they sell the 30th commemorative champagne flute in shops for 10 euros. So then you're really only paying five euros for your drink. Yeah, obviously you get to keep that um, commemorative glass or plastic glass, but it was still really good. Yeah. We enjoyed it. Um, so just pivoting quick from drinks to food, uh, special edition Dole Whip was really good. Oh yeah, so they don't apparently normally have Dole Whip in the park, but they had it for the 30th anniversary at one quick service location. And it wasn't posted on their normal menu that you can see like from the normal walking path, you have to like go down to the location. I think it was Cafe de la Bruce. I'll put some text on the screen, but yeah, they had Dole Whip and it was large. Yeah, it was very big, good value. Um, and it was really nice on a hot summer day, that's for sure. I also just really loved their castle in general. I think it is so beautiful. Like I honestly, the details in there were amazing, but then also like the dragon lives under the castle, 
you can go in the castle to learn the story of Sleeping Beauty. And then it's sort of at the end of that, there's an overlook. Like you can go stand out on a balcony at the backside of the castle and overlook Fantasyland, which is like a small thing, but it honestly, it was so cool and peaceful and nice. And yeah, they have fountains in front of the castle that like add to show elements and stuff. It's, it's a really nice castle. Yeah, and you know, they definitely have really cool elements around the castle, like the fountain, like you said, and like the dragon wreath cave. And um, they have little uh, topiaries, uh, square trees. Square trees, man. Yeah, where they really, um, you know, accentuate, um, you know, just the, the artistry of being in France. And even though we couldn't find like specialty cocktails inside the parks, really, we were staying at Hotel New York Art of Marvel and their Skyline Bar, so like the proper bar there, those cocktails were really good. They were very creative, visually stunning, also just like really well thought out and put together and very well made, which is not always the case at a hotel bar, definitely not always the case at a Disney hotel bar. Yeah, they had this really cool set of cocktails that were like the, the Infinity Stones, so they had uh, vibrant colors corresponding and also named, right? Co according to the different infinity stones. And that was uh, really nice. And just the theming of the, of the hotel and how it played into the bar. It was like you're sitting on you know, the 40th floor of a New York City skyscraper watching uh, the skyline. There was a giant LED, sc uh, LED screen with the New York City skyline with Avengers Tower uh, with its different elements, but it also corresponded to the time of day. So it was day, it was daylight, sunset, sunset, nighttime, nighttime. And um, it was just a really cool atmosphere to have some cocktails and relax after a, a long day or a long morning in the park. Yeah, it was a great bar. Like the atmosphere, the drinks were great. We were at Disneyland Paris for two and a half days and we went to that bar three times. So that tells you a lot, I think. <laughs> I really enjoyed the differences in the rides. Obviously, like, you know, they have their American counterparts, whatever. I'm not doing a compare contrast per se, but in general, I would say the rides were more intense, which I really liked. So it felt faster, there was more upside down things. And even in, you know, Omni Mover type rides, like your, your Haunted Mansion, which is Phantom Manor there, or the boat rides like their Pirates of the Caribbean, the tone was just like a little darker, a little scarier. Um, maybe that's just like more acceptable in French culture. I don't know. But I, yeah, the rides overall, I would say are more intense and I really enjoyed that. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of like how German fairy tales are very dark and scary uh, versus what we get here in America. And uh, it was very much in that vein. Um, you know, for example, in the Haunted Mansion, there were, or your Price of the Caribbean, there were like skeletons and skulls and it was very macabre and you did not get, you do not get that in Americanized Disney. One big highlight I think that we would both agree on would be the entertainment in Disneyland Paris was outstanding. Top De notch. Definitely the, the number one factor uh, for I think both of us. Yeah, it's my biggest highlight for sure. And uh, we are not show people. Like we do not normally spend our times in the parks going to shows, but we caught Mickey and the Magician on our first day. We were very lucky to just like squeak in at the end of you know getting into the theater. And I was like, oh like that was good like i'd heard it was good but i was like that's actually good and then we saw dream and shine brighter also and i died like it was <laughs> it's my favorite parade-esque thing i have ever seen either in person or like footage of on youtube like it is so phenomenal like they managed to really bring you closer to the characters closer to the dancers and cast members so colorful so fun the songs that they have are amazing i don't think I mean, I love Happily Ever After, but like that is not a bop in the same way that like Umon Kisi Lamine or Ready for the Ride is like they're Yeah, the songs they made for those were ridiculous. And then the Lion King show, which I mean, we've seen the Lion King show at Walt Disney World, so I didn't go in with super high expectations. But, you know, after we had seen Mickey and the Magician, I was like, shoot, like we should see the Lion King show. And we went on our last day and it was phenomenal. Like. Yeah, the American parks hold nothing compared to Disneyland Paris in terms of entertainment. Yeah, it was like, uh, I kind of told Jacqueline, that was kind of like a scaled down Cirque du Soleil performance um, in that there were acrobatics and aerialists and it was outstanding. It is so impressive. I can't even like describe, but if you're headed off to Disneyland Paris, even if you're not a shows person, I for sure would say you want to watch at least one like it just makes your whole time there so magical and it is such a stark contrast in my opinion to the entertainment offered in the American parks. 
All right, so those were our biggest lowlights and highlights of our Disneyland Paris trip. I think, in my opinion, biggest, biggest lowlight is operations needs a lot of work, but biggest highlight is the entertainment is absurd. Like I can't even put it into words how phenomenal those shows are. If you've been to Disneyland Paris before, we would love to hear what you think. And if you haven't been yet, hopefully this entices you to get there in the future. I would say overall the highlights still way, way, way outdo the lowlights. Oh yeah, it was still an excellent time and a great way to spend a couple days in France. We hope the rest of your day is magical. We'll see you real soon at Pixie Dust PhD. Bye.